Okay, so before we uh, talk about something new, I thought it would be helpful to review the homework assignment for today, make sure that everyone was comfortable. I had a few questions online uh, between Wednesday and today, and so I want to make sure that everyone is feeling good. So again, I don't have a textbook yet. I'm going, I am going to reclaim the textbooks uh, next week, so you need to either have them delivered by, um, by next week, or you need to have a really good friend. Okay. Uh, so, um, I need someone to help me out because of that and remind me what the model is that we're trying to uh, solve, optimize for for three. Three. Plus 2y is greater than or equal to 10. 6x plus 2y is greater than or equal to 18. Logical constraint. Yeah. All right. And I'll try to do this quickly because at this point they should start feeling like it is. Um, yes, thank you. Routine. <laughs> All right, and I'll do units of one. Okay, so, and we'll, we'll be really traditional here and do an x and y axis. All right, so um, if y is zero, x is nine. And if uh, x is zero, y is three. In what direction are we going here? We're going up, right? This is a minimization problem <coughs> rather than a maximization problem. All right. Next one is blue, and that will be five and five. One, two, three. All right. And again, same direction. And here it will be three and nine. Did I count right? Six, seven, eight, nine, yeah. And we're going in the same direction again. Okay. So let's assign this some random value. I'm going to just pick 24 because that's nicely divisible by 8 and 12. I would encourage you to, to do something similar if you're doing arbitrary. Make it easy on yourself. Don't pick uh, numbers that, that are difficult. So if we go 8x plus 12y equals 24, then when y is 0, x is going to be 3, right? Uh, and Two, and we can always we can always say, oh, that's hard to tell where that would come out. Let's double those values, and that would be six and four. Right? And that should be parallel. So now we can see that that's going to be the optimum point. Right? That's the last point as it travels down here that it's going to exit out. It's already exited out of this point here and all these, these other points down here. Right? So that's our optimum point, which happens to be what? It's the intersection of these two lines right here, right? Is, is that, is my graph correct? Is it um, x equals 3, y equals 2? Yes. <coughs> All right. So our optimum point is right there. 
Okay. That should be that should be review at this point. The new part is asking the questions, what happens if we change these coefficients, right? So what did we need to do to be able to know the ranges of these coefficients right here? What do we have to compute? The slope of what? We had to compute the slope of the objective function. What is that? Negative negative two thirds. How'd you get that? Because I don't see a two or a three here. Eight yeah, negative eight divided by twelve here, right? Is that that slope? What's the slope of this one? Negative one third. <laughs> this one. Negative one, and this one is negative three because it's six over two. Right? And so if we now order these by slope. What's our smallest slope here? Negative 3, and then negative 1, and then negative 2 thirds, and then negative 1 third. And if we then mark this, this is our objective function. This is the red constraint. This is the green constraint, and this is the blue constraint. And without even looking at our diagram, we notice that our objective function is between the green and blue constraints, which is what we identified graphically as being the binding constraint, right? So, so does the question ask what are the ranges that each of these values can be? And it actually gives you the table, right? Yeah. So let's show why that table is correct. Okay, so what's the maximum value for x and what's the maximum value for y uh, if we only change them? All right? So remember, what we have here is we have the x coefficient over the y coefficient, right? x over y is how we got these slope. And we know it has to be between negative 1 and negative 1 third if, it doesn't have to be, right? If we change those co coefficients, we would get a completely different optimum solution. The question is, if we want the same point that is optimal, how much can these deviate by? If, if, they devi if they deviated a lot, we would have some other optimum point. And that's perfectly fine. But we want to identify that because we want to make sure that our estimates when we created this model um, don't give us a false sense of security into what the right solution should be. So that's why we're looking at this range. What range of values do we get where we still get the same optimum solution, where we can be confident that no matter uh, what our estimate was, if it lies in that range, we're okay. Yes? What kind of scenario <coughs> would you want to use that for in like an actual like manufacturing or business type of thing? So uh, let's say you're trying to anticipate uh, capital good co uh, costs of capital good. You, you're going to estimate that. Uh, you don't know the elasticity of, of your product, so you don't know if in the future um, there's going to be competition and it's going to drive down the cost that you can sell something for. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uncertainty right, when we're talking about what the future is going to hold. Okay. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so let's, do, let's, let's modify this for both our x and and our y values. So well first let's let's hold our y value constant and vary our x. So our y value is 12. And so we can simply just multiply both sides by 12 here. And so we get negative 12 is less than or equal to negative 
x coefficient, which is less than or equal to negative 4. And because negative numbers everywhere kind of are messy, we're just going to multiply that through by negative 1. And when we do that, what do we need to do? We need to flip the signs of our inequality. So 12 is larger than or equal to our x coefficient, which is larger than or equal to 4. That seems awkward. I'll just change the order of them to being 4 is less than or equal. Right, those are the same ranges. Okay, so if we hold y constant, we know that x can vary between 4 and 12, and it will still produce this optimal solution. Am I good so far? Is it, is it matching what the book has? Okay, good. So let's do the opposite now. Let's hold x constant and do y. See how y can do. And uh, just as a reminder, because now we're talking about a variable in the denominator, I find it easier to do this as two sets of inequalities rather than one inequality where we're, um, and so we will we'll do our first inequality as one is less than or equal, um, <laughs> cx is eight, so negative eight over our y constant, and so we get negative one times our y <coughs> coefficient is less than or equal to negative eight. I'll do the same thing, multiply by negative one, and we'll get c of y is at least 8. Okay? Now I'll take the second half of the um, equation, negative 8 over cy is less than or equal to one third, negative 1 third, and do the same thing. I'll multiply by cy and we get negative 8 is less than or equal to negative cy over 3. And this time I'm going to multiply by negative 3 so I can get the, the fraction out of here. So we get 24 is greater than or equal to <coughs> CY. So now I can combine <coughs> these two <coughs> inequalities together and say that C of Y is between 24 here and 8 here. All right. Questions about that? Did I miss any of the parts of, of that problem? Yes? Can you just like sum up like what those, the two inequalities that we came up with, like what is that telling us? This is the range of like that we can get we're still using the same optimal point? Or so yes, so if we want, if we want to have this be our optimal point, right. and we're uncertain about x, as long as that uncertainty remains in this range, we're going to end up with the same optimum point. Likewise, if we're uncertain about y, as long as it, it remains in this range, we're okay. However, if we're uncertain about both, then all bets are off. It's only about our uncertainty in one variable or another variable at a given time. It's not about our uncertainty about both at the same time. If they both change, then that completely changes these ranges because now we're changing both parts of this <coughs> fraction and we can, we can change x a lot and y a lot and still re remain with, with that, that same slope of our equation. So then if I were to put that in like the terms of like the scenario where you use this, since yeah. it's minimizing, it would be like if we keep <coughs> the cost of x in between these ranges, then right, right. So so um it, I think it will make a little bit more sense uh, when we start put, starting to do a little bit more realistic models. Okay. Um, I was talking with Jason earlier today, and, and one of the things I mentioned that I think is good for everyone to hear is right now we're, we're doing really, really simple models because we're, we're constrained to two variables. And the reason why we're, we're impo imposing that constraint upon ourselves is so that we can graph it. Okay, and, and we want to graph it because we want to really deeply embed this visual understanding of what's going on. I want you to really be able to visualize the two-dimensional case in your head, even though we're going to go much beyond the two-dimensional case. Once we start adding more variables, we'll lose the ability to graph our solutions, 
Um, but hopefully you can sort of do a mental comparison. Like, oh, this is like when we slid this line down on the graph here. Or this is like when we move the optimum point here. So you've got that kind of intuition built into to why, why you're doing those things. Um, and those extra variables then will make the models more re robust, they'll, they'll be more realistic, and then I think um, things will, s will start to be like, oh, now I see why the these right. models uh, work. But for, uh, for now, you could, cons you could do even like um, the, the, the few ones that we've done, where this objective function was the profit we made out of our two products, the, the two different uh, styles of motorcycles. If we're not sure how much we could sell it for. Or this objective function was how much profit we could make on the sale of the different type of investment vehicles, whether it was stocks or money markets, right? So we're not quite sure about that. And so if, as long as we're in, within a certain range of that profit, we're going to be okay. Yeah, Josh, you had your hand up for quite a while. Okay. All right. So we, we said that sensitivity analysis allows us to look at these coefficients right here. And I mentioned on Wednesday, and now I want to explore more deeply, what happens if these values, the right-hand sides of our constraints are, um, we, we want to understand the sensitivity there. Because just like we don't, might know the profit that we'll make off a product, we might not know um, how much man hours we have available to us, how much of a particular um, <coughs> uh, source of a, a supply we have to, to manufacture something. We might not know um, the, the future um, fuel costs that, that we're going to encounter for, for transportation, right? There's a lot of uncertainties, and those will oftentimes <laughs> be reflected in the, the right-hand side values of, of these constraints. Before we move on and do something new, would it be possible to spend some time talking about the second question regarding the apportionments on the team homework? Because I think a lot of people were really, really confused about that, including me. <laughs> and Richard, yeah. like, there's, the next team homework is not due until next Friday, so maybe just right. some time before. Yes, I will make sure to leave enough time to do that. Uh, I want I, I want to get to to this. It shouldn't take me much time. My notes only have a half of a page, and normally I have a page or a page and a half of notes, so I should have time to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Um, so what what we want to do is um, be able to examine that. Now, unlike when we're talking about changing the coefficients of our objective function, in that case, we're talking about keeping the optimum solution the same. In this case, if we have more labor hours, if we have more supplies, if we have cheaper gas, that's going to turn out to be a different optimum solution. So we're not trying to say, is this going to be the optimum solution or not? Now what we're trying to say is, how much does our optimum solution change when one of these values changes right here? Okay, so um, let's, let's take an example here. I am going to pick the, uh, since the blue and green constraints are binding, I'm going to change this value from, from 9 to 10. What's that going to do to the blue constraint? It's going to move it up. It, is, it, is it going to change the slope of the blue line? No. All it's going to do is, is change the uh, y-intercept, right? Because the slope is still negative 1 over 3. Our slope, but our, our y-intercept just goes up by a third. Right. So approximately, right here if I can make a parallel line, is where that new constraint would be. <coughs> which would mean 
that our new optimum point has moved to the intersection between that blue and green line right there. Right? It's, it's moved along this path right here, up towards it. It still is exiting out. You can see, fortuitously, that profit line is almost exactly at that point right there. Right? So that still is the exit point. But now it's not 3, 2 anymore. It's, it's some other value. Okay. Um, and, and we'll look at that in a second. And, and so this would be our new point. So this point right here would produce a new profit. I'll just call it P new for, for a, a new profit. Um, and what, what we're going to do is we're going to compute what's called the dual. The, the dual is how much benefit a change in one of these values has to the overall objective. But we want to, to make that um, normalize so a unit here change, not some arbitrary change. So when we moved it from 9 to 10, this right hand side product went up by 1. So we want to say how much this objective function is going to do. So we're going to do the profit. So this is minimization. The, the new one is bigger than the old one <coughs> over the um, difference. OK, so this is the how much profit increase there is. And this is how much change there was on the, the right-hand side. In this case, that denominator is really easy because I intentionally picked 1 to make the denominator 1. <coughs> so all we would have to do is figure out what the new profit is, subtract off the old profit, and that's how much we were able uh, to change the objective by. In, in this case, actually, I should, sorry for those of you who are writing on paper. we want to turn out to be a, a negative value, right? Because an increase in our right-hand side results in an increase in our profit, which is negative because we're trying to minimize. So this is actually a cost, right? We're trying to minimize this value, not maximize. So because we increase the value, that's a bad thing. Yes? You're trying to maximize the uh, no, you would, but what would happen is you're, depending upon oh, the, 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 it depends upon which direction. If, if we move this down to eight, it would improve. Okay, so it's how much it's improved. And, and so it depends upon whether it gets bigger or smaller. So a minimization and a maximization problem uh, have opposites of each other with, with re <coughs> reflect, oh. respect to, to duals. Uh, you'll, you'll, for, for now, you'll, you'll be graphing it, so you'll be seeing if it's improving it or not. Once we switch to the computer, it will just automatically do the right direction for us. So we don't have to worry about that. All right. So you just have to know whether, an imp uh, if, because it's a minimization, going bigger is bad and going smaller is good. And for maximization, going bigger is good, and going smaller is bad. Um, so that's the unfortunate. You have to change direction based on minimization versus maximization. Right. The, uh, <coughs> the white textbook uses a slightly different <coughs> value that doesn't change between minimization and maximization. And so it's, uh, it actually becomes more complicated because then you need to know that um, the, the computation is easier, but the interpretation is harder. <coughs> because you have to know that a negative is bad in one case and a positive is good in the other case. In the dual, a positive is always good and a negative is always bad. Because a positive improves your objective function, a negative 
decreases your objective function. So you're just trying to get the sign of the old minus new or new minus yes. to reflect yes. whether it's good or bad. Correct. And it's just different from an hour. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so what we would do for this then is we would compute what the, the cost is here. <coughs> We subtract what cost is here, and then we would get our dual. Okay, you you when you're doing this graphically, you have to be careful because you can't just arbitrarily pick some number. Like instead, if I instead of picking ten, pick some number like um, eighteen because it doubled that nine right there, and it was just a lot bigger, that would be problematic because instead of it pushing out here, we would get a blue line way up here, like this. And it wouldn't be constraining anymore, because we would exit out of some other point. We'd be exiting out of the blue and the red point, rather than the blue and the green point, because we completely dwarf this green constraint here. Or if I move the blue line down, I could move it so far down that it was, it was way down here. And, and the blue constraint would be completely immaterial because now the green line would be a problem. So whenever you're, you're doing this graphically, you, you want to make sure that your updated value in your right-hand side right here is still, like this case, is still the optimum solution. That you haven't, run a, you haven't moved it so far in one direction, up or down, that you've caused some other set of constraints to be binding. And whether that's the blue and the red line together, or it's the green, uh, or something else. And you just have to actually test and see. There's not, there's not some rule of thumb where you can just say, oh, well, if I do it by this small amount, that's going to work for me. Because they might be really close to each other, and that small might, might be exactly what you need to, to switch what is <coughs> binding and, and what is not. Yes? So like. With the case we have on the board right now, with the blue and green lines being the optimal point, uh -huh. can you push the blue line along the green line, but above the, but on the other side of the red line? You can only go to this to point. That point. Okay. At that point, the dual becomes uh, it changes, because because now the direction that it's traveling, it's traveling along a different slope. It was traveling along this green line. And so it had a certain benefit to your optimization. But now, as we push the blue line up here, it's not traveling along the green line anymore. It's traveling along this red line. And so it's changing how much or how little that optimum value is, is affected. So, so the range of the dual is only along the binding constraints. As soon as your binding constraints change, then the dual is invalid. So if you look at your book at example 3.2, um, which is a follow-on to um, example 3.1, and maybe there's a similar one in 3.4, which is an extension of 3.3, uh, 3, you'll see that they specifically list an upper bound and a lower bound for each right-hand side value. And that upper bound and lower bound specifically relate to how far you can go along that constraint before you change which of the constraints are binding. Yes? Will we ever calculate that range ourselves? Uh, you, you, what you would do, if you could do it, not if you could, if you were asked to do it, is you would just find this intersection point right there, right there, and you would go down to here and you and you'd see that this is no longer. So you, okay. it would be this range. So you'd just see what the upper range of the intersection of the blue line would be here and what the lower line is. Can you only do it graphically? Uh, yeah, you would do it graphically, and then you'll depend upon the computer to, to give you the full range. Okay. Is the red constraint relevant right now? Not right now. Right? It's not binding. Okay. But if we bump that blue line up, it, it could, could be. Relevant. So that's what bounds this constraint from rising too high, the, the dual measurement. 
Can you define the dual again? The dual is now that we're considering that moving this blue line is going to change our optimum solution. For every one value that we change this right hand side, we're asking how much is that going to improve the objective function? It could be bad for it, right? It could be bad for it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the example we have here, right? Uh, an increase of one in this blue line is going to re reduce, so the, it's going to make it larger. So which the dual is a measure of how much the objective changes? Yes, the dual is a measure of how much this is going to change in relationship to this changing. And it's always, it's always for a particular range. Yes? Is the dual always found with the old minus the new? No, it depends upon the, if it's what the minimization or maximum. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll you'll. So if you're maxing, it would be new minus. Right, right, right. Yeah. Wait, if you're maximizing it. Would you'd be you'd flip it because it would be opposite sign. And if yeah. You minimize it, yeah. It's old minus new. Right. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so the upper constraint, I guess, where the green and the red intersect. Yes. When you find that, you uh -huh. say that it has to be less than. That. <coughs> Point right there, it can't be less than equal because if it was equal, then you have three binding constraints. No, it could be equal. So it could be, but wouldn't yeah. make the red binding constraint? That's red fine. Red. That's fine. Because it, you're lo you're looking at how much it changed between here and here, and that okay. still followed that green line the whole way, okay. and it didn't it didn't change direction at all. Yeah. It's only if it went any bit above that okay. that it would change. So the the dual is valid just for that range. Okay. okay. There is a new dual, but it's it's from here to here instead. Yeah. And we won't compute. We, we just need to know that it exists. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. So once you find the dual and it changes the and it changes the other x in your min at the top, mm -hmm. do you Yeah. When you say how much that changes by, mm -hmm. do you plug that into that and then figure out like the 10, like change the 10 then, or how do you? No, okay, so if, if this right hand side changes, right, it's like we have this new constraint here, right? Which means we have a new optimum point. We have a new value of x and y. So we would, just like here, we plugged 3 and 2 into here and we would get the minimum is 24 plus 24 <laughs> is 48. So before we changed it, the value was 24, well, it's 48. Now that we changed it and moved it up, there's some new minimum. We, so let me just pretend here that this is, um, I will say x is 2.8 and y is, it looks like 2.5. Right? I'm just eyeballing it there. We would plug in 2.8 in and 2.5 into this equation and we compute a new minimum. So let's do that. What's uh, 2.8 times 8? Someone with a calculator help me here, please, quickly. It's 22.4. 22.4, okay. And 12 times 2.5 is 18, All right? 30, I can't add. So our new minimum is 52.4. So the, the, the value of our objective function here is larger. So we, our old was, was 48, we said. Our new was 52.4. Our difference then is negative 4 point, or yeah. Negative 4.4. And so our dual says that every time we increase the right hand side here by 1, we will decrease our objective by 4.4. That's what the, uh, the negative means. So if we went up to, a, if we went from 10 up to 11, we would decrease, uh, we would worsen it, I should say. Yeah. We would worsen it by 4.4. Okay. So if we move from 10 to 11, because we know the dual, as, let's assume it comes in under that point right there. 
then we would know the objective function would go from 52.4, we would add another 4.4 to it, and we would get 56.8. Or, if we reduced it from 9 down to 8, we, and we went down here, that would improve it by 4.4, and it would go down from 48 down to 43.6, right? So whatever direction we go, we have that linear change. It's always going 4.4 for whip. <coughs> and just to, and then I'll answer your question, if we did it in a half unit, let's say we moved it to 8.5, and it would, it would improve by 2.2 because it would be half of this distance right here. So the dual is telling us for every unit of change that happens here, we can predict what the value, not predict, we can compute what the value change is going to be in here. So we don't have to graphically solve it over and over and over again. We solve it once and we know in that range how all the optimal solutions are going to be if any of these changes occurred. But you do need to graphically represent it so you know when you get out of the... Right, right. You need to know what that range is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um, So let me pause here because I want to answer Josh's question about um, the team project two, and then then I'll try to go through example so that we're we're all on the, the same page here. Okay. So pro team project two today was asking you to come up with some metrics. Um, what I was hoping that you would do is that you would look online for other people's <laughs> um, ideas of how to judge the the quality of a redistricting. In other words, if if I were, I'm going to just use this board so I don't erase what's on there. Let's pretend I had a nicely shaped state like um, Wyoming. Okay. <laughs> and, and because there's only one U.S. representative, let's think about it at a state level. Let's say we were going to allocate state representatives to, to at the, the state capital. Okay. Let's pretend that, roughly speaking, the population of Wyoming is evenly distributed. It's not completely accurate, right? You've got Cheyenne and, and a few other towns, but roughly speaking, it is. Um, if if you were to um, go out and, and say, this is what I think, uh, how we should make up the, the various districts of Wyoming. I think one should look like this, and, um, and then maybe we'll have a tiny little thing here, and then um, I, think, I think you would look at that and you would say, hmm, something fishing is going on here, right? There's something wrong uh, about this. Uh, you, you would have expected something to look more like a grid, maybe. If, if someone came back with that, you would say, I see how you came up with that. That makes sense to me. I don't see how you came up with this. This does not make sense to me, right? So I'm, what I'm looking for is some sort of way to numerically do that. Because visually, we're, we as humans got to this is great to be able to see these kinds of visual patterns and say, this is wrong, this looks more right to me. But it's hard, it's hard to, to take that um, to say a court of law or, or some sort of justification and say, see, don't you all agree with me? Because, let, let's be honest, most people don't do it this egregiously. There are some cases where they do, okay? But most of the time, they're, they're a little bit more subtle than this. And so, uh, we need to be able to identify when they've done something equivalent to this, um, but it's not noticeable to us visually anymore. 
Is there some way that we can numerically say that this way of separating out the districts is better than some other way? So in this case, the, this has to do with the, the shape of the districts. Yeah. What we want is we want a, a regular shape versus irregular shapes. <coughs> and there are mathematical measurements that, that you can do to get regular shapes. For instance, if you bound them by a circle, um, how much of the, the circle is um, covered by the district and how much of it is empty space. Uh, or you can look at the ratio of the perimeter to the area. Okay, because um, if you've got a, a really jagged shape, it can really have a long perimeter. Okay, um, you can you can bound it with with rectangular rectangles, and you want something that looks more like a square than a long uh, gated rectangle, as an example. So there there are those kinds of shape measurements that that you would put in place, and you can give them specific measurements. There's a question over here. So I found some of those things, but uh -huh. I. I didn't know how to figure out like what is a reasonable ratio that I should be looking for, and B, I don't think I could reasonably calculate it. Yes, and I'm not asking you to be able to calculate those. Okay. Um, in fact, I'm looking. I'm asking you to try to st okay. start to just research what people do think is good and bad, and what they how they would calculate. I in the end, I'm going to give you one of these metrics to, to use that is calculatable. Within our system. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you to, to do some. Some of these are, um, most of them are nonlinear, which violates one of our, our problems. So I'm not, I'm not asking you to research a method that you're going to do. I'm asking you to research how this is done, as uh, partly just to get more familiar with what good and bad uh, redistricting efforts look like. Yeah. Okay, so I get shape, like you look at a map and you like draw out, okay, these would be all the different regions. How would you do that with something else? Okay, so uh, another one, um, and this was the measurement that was taken to the Supreme Court last year for um, the state of Wisconsin, is what's called the efficiency uh, uh, value. And it has to do with um, what's called um, cracking and packing. So let's say you did want to gerrymander a state. Uh, what you would want to do in an ideal scenario is you'd like to win all of your elections with 50% plus one vote. You, you are being the most efficient with your voters uh, as you possibly can. So what you would like to do is put 50% minus one voter of your opponent into those districts that you win. And then you'll put all the leftovers of, of your opponent into one big uh, group. So if, they, if they're gonna win a district, let them win with 100% of the vote, 99% of the vote, right? It's completely inefficient use of, of their votes. And so you've cracked up their voters into just small enough pieces that you can beat them, and then you've packed all of their voters into um, inefficient uses of, of, of their voters. And so an efficiency value is a measurement of, of how, how much extra each of the different districts were <coughs> used in, in order to, um, to win a given election above what was actually needed to win that. Um, and um, and so there, there's arguments about what that, what range of efficiency <coughs> values, values are, are good or, or, or poor. <coughs> if, if if something is gerrymandered, you would expect the winners to have very highly efficient districts and the losers to have highly inefficient districts. If it's randomly chosen, you would probably expect similar efficiencies between the two opponents. All right. Yes. One thing that I found was that um, it's okay to evenly distribute a population, um, but that they you shouldn't evenly distribute the voting population. Uh, you're um, 
the the redistricting is only based on on people. <coughs> it's supposed to be only based on the census data, but any any good gerrymander is going to take into account how people voted. You know, if well, if, if you put, um, unfortunately, people between 19 and 29 vote a whole lot less than people between 60 and 100. And by a lot less, I mean four years ago, 5% of people in that one age group voted versus 80% in the other group, right? So you're gonna look at that those would be other <coughs> metrics that you look at are other demographic things and say, hmm, uh, if, if I'm a Republican and I've got this core elderly basis, I, I, I'll put um, a bunch of them with a bunch of young people. The young people won't vote and I'll carry this district even though it looks like I've, 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 I've redistricted it in a very carefully uh, way so that I'm going to get the actual votes versus the, the population that's in, in that district. And you're not supposed to do that, but that is what they do to, to well, let me, a lot of people say that's not what you're supposed to do. It's not clear whether gerrymandering, gerrymandering is illegal or not. Um, that, that, is, that has gone up to the Supreme Court and neither been rejected nor uh, affirmed. Is it? Um, and so what is not legal is a racial gerrymander. You can't intentionally do this with race as a consideration. But politics, you can. <coughs> Currently it appears like you can't, but that's, that's not clear. Uh, I was going to say that uh, a really good resource for kind of understanding this issue is uh, 538.com and the yes. gerrymandering project. Yes. And they actually have like a visual representation you can find that will show you like what the district would look like if people did the under states. Yes. It's a great way to understand the process. And they have multiple ways to to gerrymander or to not gerrymander. And you can, it, it, it's a, that is a great interactive uh, resource. <coughs> The state legislature chooses how they want to do the U.S. House district. Um, and so that's why this year's elections are so important, because most of the people who are being elected this year will be in power when <coughs> the next redistricting efforts occur after the 2020 census. Have a great weekend. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Let me tell you what you're going to be doing over the weekend for this class. <laughs> Problem 317 is what you're going to work on, and it's specifically dealing with this duel. Um, do it your best. I, I feel like today was kind of confusing. I apologize for that, and I will try to make it less confusing on Monday. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is I'm going to put up online, um, in, because some of your books have this and some of them don't, Chapter 17. Um, if you if your book came with a CD, it's on your CD. Um, if your book didn't come with a CD, that's it's missing. Uh, so I've got the I've got that chapter uh, available to you. I want you to start reading chapter 17. You'll see as soon as class is over, I'll start uploading the video uh, um, and I'll uh, try to enable the Moodle to to work. I want you to begin reading chapter 17 because we're going to transition from these graphical solutions to actually doing a uh, procedural automated way to solve these kinds of problems. Yeah. Because once we do that, we can let the computer solve it for us. All right, which is, which is, doesn't that sound wonderful? You're gonna, you're gonna feel even more like that after about two weeks when you've gone through that automated procedure by hand. All right, uh, so that's what we're gonna start working on next week. All right, have a great weekend everyone.